So um, service, what it could and should be. So if we talk about service, we need to we need to first understand what is good service. So everybody has a little bit of a different different view of this. But to you guys, what do you think um, is good service? What what do you feel when you go to a restaurant, when you go to somewhere and you say, well, that was really nice. That was really good service. What what does that mean to you? Um, well, the, the staff being attentive, um, you know, so drinks and food on time. Yeah, nothing too much, but feeling important and being looked after. Mm -hmm. So what is, what is bad service then? Um, waiting too long, sort of rude, sort of, you know, behavior, like they don't want to be there. Um, hmm. Sort of not recommending anything or like helping with guiding. Uh, okay. To know what we are serving, like in terms of, I don't know, wine or food knowledge. So that's a good service, I take it. <laughs> not a bad. Okay, yeah. So, um, like I said, so you can see the basic things that make good service are doing the fundamentals, right? So it means that you are. Uh, friendly that you are attentive so that you're not kind of flying around and you know looking at the corners or whatever but you're looking at the guests so you're always there if they need anything uh, so yeah pretty much the basics um, but what is exceptional service so I had this uh, to me the best the best service I've ever had was obviously you would expect it in a in a three Michelin star restaurant in uh, in Dorchester so what what was there? So obviously all the fundamentals were there. We didn't wait for anything. They knew everything about everything. They were smiling, they were friendly, they were attentive. But what I really liked about them is that they weren't there at all, but they were always there at the same time. And to me, that's what good service is. Good service is being invisible, but being there. So good service is when uh, nobody, we're, wait, we're waiters, we're servers, whatever you want to call it, but we should be anonymous. Uh, we shouldn't be, people shouldn't remember us. People should remember the place. That's kind of what I feel good service is. Um, and to do good service, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking uh, you need to follow the certain rules. And what are the rules? So we know some of the rules you need to do. You need to have your mise en place ready. You need to do this, like the serving from the right, um, you know, with wine, you need to serve wine labels up um, and all of these sort of things. And then uh, ladies first and all of these, uh, all of these things. Um, and they are important for a reason. So the reason why we have rules is, um, is not to follow them, but it's to know when to break them, right? So that's the, that's the purpose of rules. Rules are there to give you a core, to give you a foundation, but the actual proper service is knowing when to break them. So what do I mean by knowing when to break them? I'm not obviously encouraging you to, to break the law in general or anything like that, but it's to know that, okay, these are special circumstances. Uh, this is what we have to do. So for example, what I mean by this is, and this annoys me most about uh, proper service as people say it. Um, I'm having a conversation with somebody on my right and the server comes in and serves from my right. Good, get, get the fuck out of here. That's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is avoid conversation, avoid people, don't lean over them, give them plenty of space, don't be in their face. I don't need you to stand on my right. I need you to stand where there's space, if you know what I mean. Same as with like um, doing recommendations. You said earlier that people not recommending things um, can be bad service. Yes and no, right? So you need to be, you need, to, you need to judge the room. You need to know who you're dealing with. You have people that are big characters that are, um, you know, they're gonna come in and if you try to recommend anything to them, they're gonna think, oh, he's just trying to upsell me. He's just trying to rip me off or whatever. And you can, you can quickly lose a, a, a guest like that. So the idea is always judge the rule. So I, when, always I, when I try to teach guys how to upsell things, the idea is not to upsell everybody. You're not supposed to upsell everybody. You need to look at your guest. You need to see why they're there. If it's a couple that has their 
weekly Thursday night out and they come in and you try to upsell them for a 200 pound bottle of, of wine just because, you know, there's a, there's a, a bonus at the end of the day if you sell the most wine, you're going to lose these guests in the long run. You want them to come back because that's how you generate business. That's how you make a successful and healthy business. So if, they, if you need to judge them and if it's just their normal night, you need to give them a wine that's going to make them feel good about this place uh, and, and that's it. But if they're there for an anniversary, you need to give them a wine, not necessarily expensive wine, but it needs to be an interesting wine. It needs to be something that they will remember forever and ever and ever. Because ultimately what, what, what you're trying to do in events like this, when it's an anniversary or when it's a special occasion, is give people a memory. I don't think there's many things that are more beautiful than, you know, you're with your wife at your 10 year anniversary and you start reminiscing about your fifth year anniversary that you spent at, you know, Gaucho Birmingham uh, and Tia recommended you this beautiful wine with this beautiful backstory of this guy that was running through the vineyards and was kind of, you know, pushing the water down to, uh, to hydrate the wines or whatever. So it's, it's about that. And that's kind of what, what, what I mean by, by having good service and knowing how to break rules and, and how to upsell and when to upsell. It's judging the situation. This should be true for everything. Like uh, champagne, right? We're always taught champagne needs to be opened uh, with as little sound as possible not to interrupt everybody but what if you've got a group of you know 15 Essex girls partying and fun are you gonna are you gonna do it elegantly are you gonna just make no noise and stuff like that what's the point right so you need to judge the room when you got these five 15 Essex girls obviously it's not gonna be probably champagne it's gonna be Prosecco but you make a noise, you make a pop, you make them, everybody look at them because that's ultimately what they're looking for. You know, again, similar, if a, if a guy just proposed to a girl, you want to make a noise, people, people like that sort of thing, people like that sort of attention. So that's kind of the yeah, idea of rule breaking. And, uh, but the only way you can break your rules is if you know your rules first. So you need to know everything the right way. How do we serve people uh, wine and food? Basically, who's who gets the food first? Ladies, uh, ladies. Yeah. In in which order? The oldest one first. Yeah. Senior to youngest. Ah, depends if they have kids. Okay, so you just said senior to youngest, right? Yeah. So, but I it, thought that's changed. I it, thought it was now clockwise from the host. If that was true, that it was senior to youngest, how many women do you think you would offend on your average night out? True. <laughs> Both of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so definitely not senior to youngest. Doesn't matter which age people are. Ladies first, yes, and in a clockwise fashion. Okay. Is, it still, is it still ladies first, though? I no. thought it was like just clockwise, uh, clockwise from the host. No, ladies first. Well, again... These are my views. These are not necessarily your restaurant's views. You might have a different rule. But yeah. I do think ladies should be first. Why not? We yeah, because I'm the service. I'm I know the service we're, yeah, I know we're all about, you know, gender equality and emancipation and things like this. But I, I'm sorry, ladies. I'd like to be a gentleman still if I'm allowed to. <laughs> I'd still like to stand at a table when you go should. to the bathroom. And I'd still like to serve you first, if that's all right. Uh, so no, ladies first, clockwise. Uh, and then gentlemen clockwise and then the host obviously last. Does it matter which which gender the host is? No. No. Correct. Always last. Even if it's a even if it's a lady or if it's a, a five year old girl, she gets served last. <laughs> is that true? Would you serve the five year old her last if it was her birthday? No. <laughs> With no. the parents allowed it. <laughs> no. 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 Of course not, right? You would serve her first. This is this is the rule breaking I'm talking about. So if you know the rules, you know what you're supposed to do. But obviously, you judge the situation. It's a five-year-old girl. She's going to blow her candles and you're going to serve her last. Come on. <laughs> right? So that doesn't... That, this is what I mean uh, by this. Um, and again, so adapting as well. So uh, again, when you... For example, when you're stopping up wine, the rules should be followed the same, right? You should be topping up ladies first, gentlemen second. But again, I don't think that is true. If you've got a guy that is drinking much more than everybody else, are you just gonna 
you know, ignore him or pour him less than the others. No, you pour him the most because he's the thirsty one, which A, is good for him because he's going to be happy, he's going to be drunk, he's probably going to want to spend more, and obviously they're going to finish the bottle before as well. So that's good for business as well. But um, you wouldn't necessarily, I always, if I look at a table and a lady's got half a glass and a gentleman's got an empty glass, I'm not going to top up the lady first. I'm going to top up the gentleman first because an empty glass is worse than serving uh, the gentleman first, in my mind at least. And I think, again, it should be the same for you. It should be good service. Knowing when to break the rules and knowing how to do proper uh, proper service. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, with again, like I said, with upselling and recommending. Now, this is the tricky one. And there's, again, for business purposes, yes, you should always upsell. But again, you need to be smart about it, right? It, it annoys me when we have these uh, robot servers these days when you can see that with every single dish uh, they have a set side order that they want to push right if somebody orders uh, I don't know some sort of uh, a salmon uh, they will always say oh would you like some mashed potatoes on the side and they say it to every single table so that annoys me that shouldn't be the case when you're upselling the first thing you should always ask is the guest what do you feel like? Do you feel like more carbs? Do you feel like more vegetables? Or in terms of wine, if somebody asks you for, for a, a recommendation, don't just you know, pull the first one out of, your, out of your hat, pull the first wine that you think of, or because again, your manager said, today you need to sell 10 bottles of this and this and this. No, get their view first. What do you feel like? What do you, and again, try to feel the, the, the room, try to feel the you know, there's nothing wrong. We, we are kind of psychiatrists, psychologists, or whatever you want to call it. When a person walks in, you look at them. You look at how they're, what they're wearing. I know, especially girls, probably, you, you know how expensive that purse is <laughs> uh, or those shoes are. So that can give you an idea of the budget as well, right? So you need to know, you need to look at your guests. You need to judge them. You need to judge the interaction between them. And again, to, to use that to your advantage. Um, and then get the questions right. So what are the questions? So if, you, if you're talking about upselling in terms of wine or selling in general or recommending, let's say, I hate the word upselling, recommending wine, what, what are the questions you should always ask? What's the first one? How do you feel? Yes, how do you feel or what do you feel like? Uh, do you feel like white, red? Yeah. And, or to go for something maybe that you already know, a grape that you already know, or something like an adventure that you want to try something new, no? Yes, but these would be kind of second and third questions. So first question would be, what do you feel like? Because first you need to get that. Now, what a lot of people, a lot of servers make a mistake here is they say, what do you feel like? And they stop there. No. Okay. You need to give people the, the, uh, some options. People don't know what do you mean by it. Right? And especially for us in, in, in London, in this business, a lot of, our, uh, a lot of us are native speakers. Um, so our English, even though we think it's good, uh, might not come across that well. So always give people options to give them a better understanding, to, get, to make them feel more comfortable that they know what they're doing. Um, so what do you feel like? White, red, sparkling, anything like that. Just give them a few options. So again, kind of puts the ball in their court. There's two reasons for that, and I'll get to, to, to the other one as well. And for example, they will say, okay, we feel like we're gonna start with some sparkling and then we're gonna do some, um, some white and some red. And you're like, great, fantastic. So, um, and then what do you do first? So you need to take the order for sparkling right away. Why? Because in the meantime, they're not gonna get bored. In the meantime, that you're gonna choose the red or the white. Exactly, so first- Or waiting for food. So get the sparkling out of the way so you can, you can serve it as an aperitif while they're choosing everything else so they can take their time. Because if people can take their time, that means A, they're gonna be less stressed. And if people are less stressed, means they're more open to many things that you might have for them. Um, uh, sorry, somebody just knocked on the door. Um, what are they doing? Um, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to calm them down. Second thing is, the more time a person obviously is going to look at, for example, a menu or a wine list, the more chances there are they're, gonna, they're probably going to go for something a little bit different. And ultimately, this is what we want because we want people to go for a variety of things, both in food and in wine, um, because 
that means that we move stock. If people constantly just order one particular wine, then we're going to have one uh, wine that keeps on selling, and all of the other ones are just going to sit there in a in a shelf and just kind of slowly fade away, which is not what you want. You want the stock to move. Uh, also, it gives people, you know, something to talk about. If every guest that comes to you, um, you know, for Gaucho, for example, if every single person orders in a Patricia, you know, that's that's a pretty boring experience for people i would say you need to get them interested there's so many beautiful wines that that you have there's so many beautiful dishes and if everybody just had the same um you know you're not really providing the best service as as we said before anyway so you do the sparkling sparkling wine first and then when you come to the whites again this is with sparkling wines unless you're like a super fine dining place don't try to waste too much time on it just try to get get a sense of their budget and, and get them there. But with, when it comes to whites and reds and when they have a little bit more time, this is where you need to get a little bit more creative. And this is where you need to start to, again, get to know the guests a little bit better, uh, hint at the dishes that they might have or get information on what they're thinking about. You know, if somebody wants a, a meaty starter um, uh, or if they want a light, fresh starter, like, a, I don't know, a, a fishy thing or something, that can already kind of start shaping what your selection is going to be so for example if you start with a wine list of 300 wines that you can choose from you need to get this wine list down to three wines that you're gonna end up proposing to the guest um, and like i said this is what you do with these questions so elena said very very well um, do you feel like something classic or do you want to experiment try something a little bit different right so this already breaks down your wine list most wine lists are going to be about 60% classic, um, and then the rest is going to be a little bit quirkier, or a little bit more interesting, right? So if somebody says classic, okay, so from 300 wines, you went down to 200 wines now. Um, and then are there any particular grapes you enjoy or something? Uh, again, just try to get as much information as possible, and this will end up breaking the wines down. And the reason why I said you need to come down to three wines is because this is how you're going to end up upselling or selling the one that you want um, because it's all about a how you phrase things and b and this is the most important thing you can never select the wine for the guest that's why it always needs to be an option you always need to give them at least two or three different options that they will choose from now, why is this so important because if they don't like the wine it's it's their fault it's not yours right it needs to be their fault Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Obviously your job is to present it accurately. You know, if you're gonna say that the Riesling uh, from from Germany is, uh, I don't know, an Auschwitz Riesling is uh, super full bodied and, and bone dry and the guest opens it and it's light and fresh and sweet, that's on you. So you need to know your stuff. But again, you shouldn't be the one choosing the wines. You should let the guest always choose the wines. Okay. Does that all make kind of sense? Yeah. 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 Yes. So other rules as well. You've got rules about glasses. Um, if you bring a fresh bottle, do you change the glasses? Not on the side. Sorry, say again? Not unless I ask. Anybody else? Yes, well, I offer them. And if they know, if they say no, then no. Correct. So you need to offer, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, again, the idea is encourage not to change the glasses, not because we are lazy or whatever, but it's good for the planet. I, you people shouldn't be using 10 different glasses at the same time. Uh, and, you know. If, you, if you're a wine guy and you go to wine tasting, you get one glass for the 200 wines that you have there. So there shouldn't be any excuses that people shouldn't be reusing their glasses. Uh, you should be reusing glasses. That's good for the environment. Obviously, if the wine changed or even the vintage has changed, you do need to change the glasses. Otherwise, you don't want that mixing and blending. But yes, it's, they're not going to ask for it. You do need to offer. So once you bring, bring the host um, a fresh glass for the tasting, at that point, you would say, would you like me to change the glasses for everybody else as well? And again, hopefully they, they, will, they will say no. Um, 
yeah, but if it's a different completely wine, what's the, what's the point? Of course, you need to change the glasses, no? If I'm drinking Malbec and I will just pass for a Pinot Noir or something like that, are two different wines, like I'm not going to mix everything. Because even if I finish my first previous wine, it's going to mix with the other one, no? Yeah, that, that's what I said. So unless it's a, so if it's the exact same wine, really encourage people not to change the glasses. If it's a different uh, vintage or a different grape, obviously you need to change the glasses. Okay, perfect. No, there's, no, there's no question. There's no offer though. You don't even have to offer. You change it yourself without, without question. Okay. Okay, now uh, in terms of tasting wine, okay, so why does the host taste the wine? To make sure there's no um, defaults or if they like it, you know. <laughs> yeah, so in the past, and this was this used to be the case, the host would literally, you would pour them a taste so they could check that whether the wine is in good condition. Now, as time has evolved, um, most places the the server will will have tasted the wine beforehand or at least kind of checked it uh, or we still offer a taste and like you said yes that is kind of like a it's a nice gesture for people to taste it but technically what happens if a guest says i don't like the wine so it's a perfectly good condition but he doesn't like the wine what do you do I suppose, well, I don't know, you'd find, try and find out what's wrong with it and then offer to replace it. Um, but, yeah, you, you know, you don't go, yeah, I don't know, do you charge them for it? Because usually we, if they don't like it, then we just take it back and let them choose something else. But, right, so, yeah. see, this is, it's a, it's a problematic question and this actually happens quite a lot. So this brings me back to the one that I said before. Always make sure that the guest chooses the wine. If he, if he unequivocally chose the wine, he has no leg to stand on. Obviously, if he is that sort of, or she is that sort of guest, um, it's a little bit more difficult. Yes, you will replace the wine. But what if that wine is 400 pounds? Are you gonna do the same? You're gonna replace it? Even if it's in perfect condition? I don't know, manager's discretion, I think. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. You guys, you guys, I assume, want to be managers at one point. What would you do? Oh, I don't know. I'd really have to speak to them and see what type of people they are. Um, if there's nothing wrong with it, then I, I don't know. I'd probably charge them. They've obviously got the money to pay. Definitely, yeah. What if uh, they thought they ordered a 40-pound bottle of wine, but it was a 400-pound bottle of wine? Then it's probably the server's fault, because we should... Uh, we, we should, should repeat. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we should repeat the name of the wine or make them to point it out on the wine list, so therefore you can avoid these situations. Yes. So that's the whole point. So everything comes back down to doing the first steps right. If you did the first steps right, there is no way there's a complaint ever going to happen. It can't. If you've pointed the wines, when I said when you try to bring the wines down to to the let's say the three favorites, you always need to show the wine. And this is the trick that I learned at Sketch when I was there. Always kind of gently point your finger towards the price, just so they see it, so there's no excuse. And if somebody says, I don't wanna see the wine list, just bring me that and that. No, you will show the price always. Always confirm this is how you avoid things like this. Because yes, when it comes to a 400, 500 pound bottle of wine, that's it's very hard to take that back and i don't think a lot of restaurants will will take a bottle of wine like that back even if it's in perfect condition the only reason why i would personally take it back is if i had the opportunity to serve that wine by the glass anyway and i could kind of get rid of it that way but otherwise there's there is no there is no solution there and what this means is you're going to have an unhappy unhappy guest so again, very, very important that you never choose the wine for them. They need to be the ones choosing the wine. Again, this just protects you from all of these things. And like I said, very, very important. Okay, enough about bollocks like this. Let's talk about decanting. Uh, and decanting is one thing that 
I'm, I'm a big fan of. So guys, when do you decant a wine? When it's too old. Okay, and he keep, keep saying reasons. What else, what else do you think? If, you th if you've tried it before and you think it needs it, um, if the guest asks for it, because I mean, you can decant any wine, even if it's the cheapest. Um, when you say you think it needs it, what does that mean to you? Like if you've tried it before and you know that it needs a little while to breathe, in, you know, for optimum. Okay, flavor. that's a good point. So how does it change? What does, it, what does the air, air do to it? Opens it up, sort of makes it, you know, you get the full, full of flavors and smells from it. Air rates, is it air rates or something? Yeah. So do you know why that happens? Why 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 does air do that? Why does it why does it help open up the wine? Um, so let's do the oxygen. <laughs> um, so it's actually you know a much <laughs> Mary, you know the answer to this one. <laughs> no, 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 just expose yourself, my love. <laughs> <laughs> You're the expert. <laughs> okay, so what I like to how I like to explain this is I always compare wines to people. I've said this before uh, as well. And imagine you're a wine, right? And you are locked in, you're locked in a room, no doors, no windows, no air whatsoever, only a tiny little hole like the cork that is there. And you are locked in that room for about three to four years. Once somebody finally opens a hole in the wall or whatever, do you feel like a human at that point? Do you feel like your absolute best? Depends if I have a shower in the room. You don't, you have nothing. You, cannot, you don't even move, you stand in one place. You, you have no space. I would assume you're not a proper human at that point, right? So the first thing you would wanna do after a time like that is definitely yes, get some air into you, get some fresh air, stretch out, uh, you know, obviously take a shower as well, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> the same point, but it doesn't really work with the analogy of the wine. Uh, but yeah, that's and that's how I feel. Wine, wine feels as well. Wine is a living, a breathing thing. It constantly evolves. It constantly changes, and it acts the same way as you would in the same sort of environment. So most wines are. are no, it's all right. It's just live. You see. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, guys. Another house night came in. Okay. Um, so, and. Like you said, yes, the, the main reason for the canting should be uh, to give wine life or to, um, to accelerate uh, kind of the life of the wine, right? So I always say you should decant everything. Doesn't matter what it is. You decant white wine, you decant red wine. Um, Obviously, maybe not a, a three-month-old Pinot Grigio or New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc because that's really not going to make much of a difference. But anything that's kind of over over a year that it's been kind of locked up will benefit from some of that uh, freshness. And there is a common misconception, like Elena, you said before, that you decant uh, older wines. Now, that's not always the case. Um, it's quite the opposite, actually. The younger the wine, the more it will benefit from from decanting because when it's still young, it had all of those aromas and they're kind of bunched up in the tiny little space between the cork and the wine. Um, and they're just kind of dying to get out and you need to kind of help them out. With older wines, obviously the cork starts to deteriorate a little bit more. So there's more and more air slowly coming in. And obviously, I don't know if you know the, the expression oulage. So oulage is when, if you've ever seen an older bottle of wine and, um, there's much more space between the wine and the, and the cork. So it's basically evaporating with time, like a 30 year old bottle of wine will generally have quite a, quite a bit of oulage, probably about a centimeter or so. Um, so if there's more space and there's more air coming in, the wine tends to start to become a little bit more delicate, a little bit more fragile as well. Again, similarly compare it to people, right? Uh, if you, this is gonna sound bad, uh, if you grab a baby and you and you shake it by its leg, it's going to be fine, right? Maybe it's not the best thing to do, uh, but it's going to be absolutely fine. But if you did the same thing to your 90-year-old grandma, I wouldn't really do that, would I? Right? So there's a certain time until ben uh, decanting an old wine would benefit the wine. So when the wine has still some sort of youth, some sort of kind of um, structure to it, then yes, decanting is definitely good. But with an older wine, you would try to avoid that and maybe not decant at all. 
Um, that being said, the other main reason for the canting is for uh, visual purposes. Now, you've all seen sediment in wine. You've seen those little bits at the bottom. Um, and while they're perfectly healthy, and I can tell you a lot of wine guys eat it <laughs> or, or drink it. I did myself. It's, it's actually pretty good. Uh, but it is a little bit unpleasant. Uh, so we do want to get, we don't want the guests to really have that uh, in their glass. So that's why you would decant it. And this is where the proper practices of decanting come in. Right, so you've all seen these people with candles and just kind of slowly pouring it, but this is all mute. There, there, there is no point for you to use a candle if you didn't do the first step right. And the first step is storing the wine correctly. So a wine over time, so for example, if this is a bottle, over time, if you keep the wine standing up, the the sediment will come to the bottom, right? And if it's all around the bottle, once I, once I do it like this, the, the top ones, shit, you can't really see. <laughs> Let me see. The top ones from here are gonna start mixing up with the wine already. So I kind of, the, the chance of me intercepting those sediments are pretty much minimal. But if you store the wine correctly, if you store it on your side, your whole place, all of the sediment will be down here in this one little spot. And that means that I'm much more likely to be able to intercept the sediment at the, at the last point. Now, this is also where it's important when the wine sits in a wall, for example, you don't take it like that, right? You take it gently and elegantly. You don't move it much. Definitely do not twist it. Always needs to be like that. So what this means is, that's why I get upset when I see our wine wall and the wines are not pointing the labels up. Because as we know, if you wanna present the wine to your guest, the label needs to be sitting up. So if it's not sitting up, you're gonna to have to turn the wine. And if you have to turn the wine, you have mixed up the sediment. And if you've mixed up the sediment, your decanting is not gonna work and the person's gonna get sediment in their glass and you've got a complaint on your hand. And even if it's not a complaint, it's a very bad thing to do. What's the what were you trying to do with decanting anyway if you didn't intercept it? All right, so very important that the wines are, <coughs> pardon me, always stored correctly, always on their, uh, on their side with the label facing down. And once this is done, then yes, you go to, the, to your candle and you gently pour the wine over into the decanter while looking through the neck. And what you're doing that by looking through the neck, you're trying to see where the, where the start of the sediment starts. And that's when you stop pouring the wine. Now, ideally, you wouldn't uh, leave too much wine in the bottle, but obviously sometimes you will. Um, you do have to, uh, if there's quite a bit of wine left in the bottle, you have to say this to the guys. Just you tell them, uh, there's a little bit of wine left in the bottle, but it's mixed with sediment. Um, would you like to have it? And some people will still say yes to that. Uh, but yeah, it's... Most people won't. Um, one other thing I always, I wanted to go back to service in general is what you, how do you open bottles, right? So the main, the, the main thing for, uh, I don't like about service is when you go to a place and a waiter opens the bottle in the air and he wildly twists it around like that as he cuts the foil and then you know, pulls it up. That shouldn't really be the case. You should always really be putting the wine on some sort of a station or if there's space on the table in front of the guest and just gently pour the wine over there. So it needs to be confident, it needs to be quick, but it needs to be elegant as well. It doesn't matter where you work, whether it's a, a, a McDonald's or it's a three Michelin star restaurant, you should always be elegant at whatever you do. If you're not elegant, that actually makes people lose appetite and it just, it's not, not good. Um, and yeah, same comes to decanting. Don't be afraid of it. There's not much you can really mess up. As long as you're, you're gentle and confident, everything will go absolutely fine with that. Okay, you guys have any questions about decanting? Oh, by yeah. the way, I did mention, when I said decant everything, I do mean everything. Even champagne, even sweet wine, you can decant. Obviously champagne, be very, very, very gentle 
if you do it. Uh, but you can decant everything. Uh, I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, if we are in a busy service, for example, I don't know, Christmas time, or you've got a full building and everything, and you've got just three decanters in the building, yeah. what you gonna, like, which one you're going to give the priority to decant? In that point, I think depends on the guest, if he asks, like, necessarily, no? Yes, so when I say decant everything, that just means, again, you have to adapt to the situation and adapt to the place. Now, our places, both of our places are not, we, we're not famous for decanting everything. We really decant just kind of the top, the top stuff. Um, I would like to change that if I could and decant everything just to enhance the experience. But again, like you said, that's not very efficient, especially in a, in a busy Christmas, Christmas period. So again, it shouldn't be your decision to decant anything. You should always give the, the guests that option, but you should give them the option. You should always offer, would you like me to decant this for you? And when you said only, if you only have three decanters in the building, well, at that point you need to fire me because then it's my fault that we didn't get more. Or us because we broke them. <laughs> well, I didn't want to say that, yes, because last time I bought 24 and I think we've left with 12. So. And another one. Um, yeah. one. Once one guest asked me to filter the wine, so I just like went around and asked everybody because, of course, I didn't know how to filter it or what to use to filter it. And we've got the, this small, little, tiny filter that is coming with the Coravan, if I'm not wrong. And I've done it, like I've put a filter um, on the decanter and I just filtered the wine through the filter into the decanter. Is that right or? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the way to do it. Why did he ask you to filter it? Was it really bad? Uh, no, because it was, um, was an idea. They were like Martin's friends. Yeah. Like, and they both, like without corkage, like 20 bottles of wine and they had 20 glass each on the table. And actually, I used another table for the service because I was opening a bottle after another. And uh, he asked me, like, for that particular bottle of wine, I think it was an 89 bottle of wine. Yeah. And you know, a very, very... Uh, I mean, yeah, look, there's a, there's a lot of different ways to filter it. You can filter it through a, a, a thick napkin. It needs to be a thick napkin um, and not perfumed, obviously. You can filter it through a normal sieve, um, like... Where did we use this? There was one place we had, they were kind of like tea strainers and you would just use the yeah. tea strainer for that. So pretty much anything that will catch the thing. Obviously try to make it look elegant. Don't really take the dirty napkin from your from your lap. But if you, if you do use a napkin, you know, use obviously, a, sorry, I shouldn't say napkin. I should say tissue paper, um, not napkin. Because um, napkin is gonna drink up too much. Absorb, paper. yeah. Yeah. Ideally, you would always use some kind of a metal sieve. That would be ideal. Like the, the, tea, the tea strainers, those, those work really, really well. Um, but again, if they brought it over, correct? So the problem why he, I, I think I know which guy this was. Uh, yeah, the tall one. The... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think the reason why he asked you to filter it is because as he was traveling, he couldn't really keep the wine in... Um, the right position in the right position in a piece so it probably got mixed up um but yeah in a, in a restaurant if they didn't bring their own wines you will very rarely have to filter a wine if you've done everything else up to this point correctly all right cool anything else about decanting guys all right um Coravan. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it is a very, very fun device. It kind of revolutionized our business. It allowed a lot of the businesses uh, in hospitality to expand their by the glass selection. So from, you know, previously you could have maybe six, seven, eight wines by the glass. So you, you, you didn't lose them um, over a week of, of not selling. Uh, with Coravan, you are able to um, keep the wines for much, much longer. And I can attest to the fact we actually, in one of the places that I worked, we had a, a bottle of wine that lasted well over a year and it was still perfect. Now, on the other hand, here, we've lost a few wines uh, after a few weeks. And why was that? So, very simple reason. Coravan is, works absolutely perfectly. But you do need to, use it right, not just the, 
the device itself, but also once you've core around the bottle of wine, what do you think how you should store a bottle of wine after you've core around it? In which position? Run. Like not not in the wall. Upright. Then yeah. Why upright? Why? So um <laughs> Okay, so if you keep a normal bottle of wine upright, what happens over time? The cork dries out, no? Because mm. When you keep a wine upright, there is space between the wine and the cork. So the, the, it's not uh, moisturizing the cork. So the cork dries up. And as it starts to dries up, because obviously the, the oxygen is still coming in, as it dries up, it loses its structure and it starts to crumple. So it, and this, the more it crumples, the more it dries out, the more air it lets in and so on and so forth. So a lot of, lot of bad things. So it doesn't matter if it's, in, as soon as a bottle of wine, any bottle of wine should always be stored in a way where the wine touches the cork, whether it's a wine that it's open or it's corvant or it's closed, or whatever it is, the cork should always be in touch with the wine. Um, ideally, at least, even if you can't do that, obviously some places are, are stuck to having their wines upright, at least try to uh, shake the wines once a week just to give them a little bit of moisture so they don't go bad or ideally would have a proper place at least for them uh, which would be relatively uh, wet uh, well not wet but moist that makes sense so this is one thing that I've noticed so if you store the wine correctly even on Coravan it can last for a very very long time and it will be absolutely perfect it will be fresh but do keep it down um, so this is one of the things also, if you keep it down and if you keep it in the right position, you are not going to have a, a problem with the cork bits. So as you know, because the core one has that little needle that goes through the cork, pretty much pumps the hole through it, uh, you can be left over with some bits of it in the glass. Now, while there's nothing wrong with that, cork is natural, it's a tree, basically. Uh, it's again, not very, very elegant. Um, so if you do keep the wine on their side, it's less likely that these bits will come in. But what do you do if they do come in? Elena, you should know this. You've just had the answer for that. Um, filter it. Filter it. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to serve a guest with, with cork bits in your, in, your, in your glass. I learned that the hard way at the Tumish Next Star restaurant. Because I didn't, I didn't pay attention. And this is what I learned most there. It's about paying attention to every little detail. It does matter. One piece, piece of cork bit matters. Do not put it in there. Okay. Now, there is one last thing that I want to show you guys. And I've actually, because I, I cannot do it even if I wanted to, I've actually um, took a video from online. And this is a very interesting technique that you might uh, see sometimes. But it's... Um, quite an interesting one. So sometimes a wine is so old that the cork is completely crumpled. So there is no way to safely remove it from the bottle. Now, what do you do in that case? So this is where pour tongs come in handy. And pour tongs are this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the video and you'll see what it is. So one element of the service here at Love Madison Park. Do you hear the sound? Always push the envelope, do something different. Yeah. yeah. Classicism. Um, one thing that we do here is uh, we call port talk. Um, it was a technique used specifically for port, as you can imagine, um, to go to bypass the cork and just get at the wine. You know, red port. You know, typically uh, the ruby ports, the uh, the vintage ports. Uh, they're aged for quite some time before they're kind of enjoyable in a way. Uh, sometimes up to 50, 60, 100 years even. At that point, the cork is does nothing other than keep the wine in. It's not very easy to pull it out. So what you'll do, you'll just uh, essentially cut the top off the bottle and pour the wine out. So these are the four tongs. Pretty simple process actually, and it tends to be, this is the most dramatic aspect of it, is the fire, because it's a very seamless, quick cut. Um, 
but it's just, it's very beautiful when, when I think when executed well. It's effective. We just need to get the wine. We don't need the cork. We don't want the mess. So we usually put this over the flame for about about a minute or so. We need to get the the, the tongs red hot. Melt down the wax. in the water. Voila. Oh, wow. Now we'll just decant it. You see, so typically what you would uh, be decanting for, you're not usually worried about any glass. It's a very clean break. Really just trying to keep out uh, any, any of the large sediment. So I have a, a light source down here. Just washing for sediment. You do all the decanting through either a uh, metal mesh strainer or cheesecloth, depending on how old the wine is. You can do the service like any other bottle of wine straight from the decanter or tongue. All right. So that's a pretty cool idea. Uh, obviously, it's it's not often that you're going to be able to do this. Um, but I, I thought it was a good idea for to show you guys, just so you know that this exists as well. Um, but yeah, the idea basically is you heat up, heat up the glass and then, I don't know if you've seen when he put the, the brush, he put it into ice water. So obviously that ice water and, and the hot glass reacted with each other. You could even hear a little bit of a crack. And yeah, um, I was hoping you guys were paying attention to how he was decanting the wine. He didn't take his time. He didn't do anything special. So because he was filtering, he didn't have to be very, very slow about things. And this is what a lot of sommeliers or, or, or servers in general make a mistake when they try to um, sometimes decant too slowly. Now, today's session is about service. So one thing we did mention about service and it's the most important thing about service is efficiency. And efficiency comes from, you know, you have your mise en place, you have everything ready. You're not running around like a headless chicken trying to find extra glasses or borrowing a, a wine opener from your from your colleague because you forgot yours at home again. So if you have all of these things, you can be quick. And the quicker you are at a table as well, the more time you have for the the extra, the bonus things. Okay, so this is what's what's important about service in general. Always be quick. Always be efficient. Don't waste time. Um, even when you're opening. Anything that you do, you do it quick and you do it right away. You don't, you don't wait. You can, uh, if you need to, if you want to stay at the table longer, you can always do that and just chat. Uh, if obviously the, the situation is like that, but the, the actual duties that you have to do need to be quick, fast, efficient, cleaning the tables, uh, changing glasses, pouring wines as quick as possible. Okay. Okay, and that's pretty much it for me from what I wanted to talk to you about, um, about service today. Um, but yeah, guys, that's it for our session. Do you guys have any questions, anything from the, from the other, other sessions or anything else you, you might be interested in? Nope. All right. No. When you said the um, the port tongs, I honestly thought, have you seen that other type of bottle opener where it's it's like a fork and you you sort of stab it in to yes. the cork and you just that yeah. is, uh, I have it always with me. Uh, it's a device called uh, Aso or a two prong cork uh, corkscrew. Well, it's not a corkscrew. Um, 
obviously today I don't have it with me, even though it's normally always in my pocket. But it's a really cool device. So basically, it's like a, it looks kind of like this, right? Yeah. And it's very simple to use. So obviously, you take the take the foil down. Let me try to cover it. Take the foil down, and then you have these two tongs. One of them is generally a little bit longer than the other, and you would put the longer one between the bottle and between the cork first, and you kind of stick it uh, maybe like a half a centimeter down, and then you put the other one on the other edge between the cork and the bottle. And this is where a lot of people make a mistake and they start to push uh, down on the cork, which you shouldn't do. What you should do is you start just swaying the wine, by uh, swaying the, the, the tool, the asso, in your hand and it will automatically stop start going deeper and deeper you don't have to if you push you will push the cork in but if you just kind of sway gently because of the movement it will just kind of slide into and it will hug the whole cork and once it hugs the whole cork all you have to do is turn it turn the turn the cork uh, the fucking device uh, <sighs> and it slowly comes up you don't have to pull either again as you pull it will come out and the good thing about the ASO is, again, because it hugs the cork, it doesn't make a hole in the cork. So you're not gonna get any any sediments in the, in the bottle. Um, and also because it hugs the whole cork, you get a much better grip uh, to it. It's a really cool device. If you learn how to use it, it can make you much, much faster. Um, I try to use it as often as possible for two reasons. A, because people are not used to seeing it and it's quite a show uh, when I use it. And like I said, B, it's efficient. It's very, very, very quick. Um, and, and there's a C actually. Uh, the good part about that is if you have a good ASO, it will keep the cork between the, the two prongs. Uh, and that actually allows you to even put the cork back in. Uh, and that can be a pretty cool idea when you are uh, decanting wine. So you would, gently take the foil down, you would use the asso to take the cork out, you would pour the wine uh, into the decanter, and then you would put the cork back in, and if you cut the foil correctly, you could put the foil back on as well. So, correct way to cut the foil in wine is under the bottom lip, always under here, right? Mm -hmm. That's the correct way. The worst way to do it is at the top. This is, for some reason, the Italians like to do it up here, but don't do that. Uh, it is not, it doesn't look good for one, uh, and it can give you quite a bit of um, uh, like a drop spotting off of the wine. Now, I've actually learned a third way, and it was pretty much the reason why I took my job at Sketch at the time. I came to my, my trial shift, and uh, the wine director, Fred, was opening a bottle of wine, and he cut it here in the middle, and I was like, why why do you do this and he said because it's hard <laughs> and i was like yes i want to work for this guy uh, but that's not the only reason that it's hard uh, the good thing if you cut it in the middle is that that allows you to actually put the foil back on top and it can actually look like the, the wine is still closed so again it's a really elegant way so if you've decanted the wine if you even put the cork back in and then you put the capsule back on top it kind of looks like you haven't touched the bottle so it, it makes for a little really, it makes for that little detail, like the extra service that I said, uh, that just kind of makes makes the evening for the for the guest a little bit more special. Another question: I've seen a lot of people, like my colleagues, that after opening a bottle of wine, they're leaving the cork on the table. Is that like part of the standard, or for what? If the guest asks, uh, it it should be part of the standard. So ideally, you would have some sort of a um, like a coaster or a side plate. Uh, that you would give to the host. Um, so once you pop the cork off, before you pour him the the taster, you would you would give him the cork uh, on some sort sort of a, a platter. Um, now some people collect corks, so that's one reason. Uh, some people just want to check the corks. Um, but yeah, there's. I mean, it is a rule. It is a standard. It's not that that followed uh, anymore. Again. The main reason is because of the mess and the efficiency, right? So this is an extra step that you have to do. So you need to judge again where you are and what sort of what sort of situation you are in. Um, if you if it's a, a, a slow Monday night and you've got some really special guests, by all means you do every single step. You take your time with it. You do it right. You do it specially. 
Of course. But again, on a Friday in December, I would much rather you just everything that's dirty, everything, capsules, corks, everything, just put it in your pocket, make sure your service is quick and efficient. Um, it, will, it will mean much more to them, again, if you're fast and you have time to maybe talk to them and recommend some things more, rather than doing these tiny little steps. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, this is the point of rule breaking. You need to know the rules. Yes, you should be doing those things, but again, judge which is the lesser evil, let's say. That's kind of what you should be thinking about. Uh, but yeah, like I said, if this is not going to impact service as much as you are not having to time to talk to them. That makes sense. Yeah. But but things like showing the label and pouring them a taste and doing it clockwise, this is important. This is this should be followed as much as humanly possible. Again, because it does make a difference. All right. Okay. Anything else, girls? No. All right. So that's it for our session. It was a lovely nine weeks, I think. It was pretty good. Pretty good. Um, but yeah, that's it. I will upload this last one up there as well. Um, do you guys need the presentation? Not really, huh? Please. No. Sorry. Maybe to share with the others? Sorry? To share with the others? Or are you going to save the video? Oh. As yeah, yeah, I'll put it on. It's fine. It doesn't takes me a few minutes um, All right. but yeah thank you very much for your attention uh, and yeah that's it if you have any questions at any point um, you know just contact me you've got even on the website you've got the contact form if you don't have my details for some reason okay thank you guys thanks a lot thank you very much thank you Lena. cheers bye-bye